Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. If you are new here and you start enjoying what you are listening to or you've already been here and haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does that help support the channel, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Backwoods Creepy Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer for anyone who hasn't heard, if you would like your birthday to appear within the videos and get your shout out at the end, please go over to the community tab and place your birthday under the correct posting that I made a few days ago. Posting birthdays in the comment sections of the videos are just a little overwhelming as there are a lot of comments to get to and I'm afraid I might overlook yours. Thank you all for understanding. Now, let's get you that vocal melatonin that sends you straight into slumberland. This happened about 20 years ago while hunting with my dad in Northern BC. It was a cold October morning and it was still dark when we parked the truck and started our hike into a clear cut. I was familiar with the area as we had moose hunted there before. My dad went left and I went right and I made my way to the top of a slope to get a better view of the clear cut. I found a stump to sit on and took out my binoculars and quickly found my dad in the clear across the mountain. As soon as I spotted him, I heard something heavy move behind me in the forest, roughly 40 yards away. I'm thinking, yes, a moose. I then head towards the forest's edge when I hear a scream or screech unlike I've ever heard. It did not sound human and wasn't like any animal I've ever heard before. It was so loud, and I swear my soul left my body for just a few seconds. I turned around and ran down that clear-cut hill as fast as my teenage legs would take me. When I got to my dad, he had said that he had heard it too and found me in his binoculars running down a clear-cut, then looked up at the forest's edge and said he saw a big, hairy, human-like creature standing about eight foot tall between two birch trees. It stayed for a few seconds, then turned around and disappeared. We got in the truck, went home for the day. We asked elders and relatives about it when we got back, and they called them the Forest Guardians. It still scares the hell out of me to this day. I have one that happened during the pandemic. My partner and I were on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, doing what most younger couples do. Take a van, put a mattress in the back, and drive around the island, camping in random woods. The weekend we chose was particularly busy, so every campsite was full. The thing with Vancouver Island is that is a lot of logging roads with many pull-offs. We were traveling from one old growth forest to another when it was getting dark. We found a random turnoff that had an old gate ripped off. This was very common. And pulled to an area, lakeside. As we pulled up, we noticed that there was a fire with another couple, one other van, and a tent on the other side. We got out and chatted with the couple, who was quite nice, and asked about the tent. Turned out it was empty when they got here the night before. Now, this wasn't some rundown tent. It was quite new, had a brand new paddleboard, 
books lying about the fireplace, a hammock strewn up, but whatever, we didn't give it a second thought. My partner and I went to bed early, got up, and the van was gone, but the tent was empty. We didn't think anything of it, so we went into town, which was a little ways off, did some hikes, explored a bit, and decided to go back to our lakeside camping spot. We got back. The tent was still there. At this point, we think, okay, it's been three days and still no one? With all of this gear laying about? My mind is now going to the worst scenario. Oh God, what if someone is dead in there? At this point, the sun is setting and we're both freaking ourselves out. My partner starts joking about vampires, but I decided to look into the tent. I open it, very reluctantly, and it's empty. Thank God. But there's a note inside in French. Thankfully, my partner can speak French and translates it. It turns out two friends of this person had come to the spot expecting to meet some girl four days before we had gotten to the site which means the tent had been there for at least four days. Now we're thinking, God, what if this person got kidnapped or killed and we're staying here? Or what if some murderer is on the loose? At this point, we didn't want to drive anywhere since it was starting to get dark and everywhere else was full from what we saw. This is when all of a sudden, out of the bushes, out comes a small shadow which scared the shit out of us. It's a pet fucking rabbit. It hops over to us and we notice there's rabbit food under a tarp near the tent. Probably 45 minutes later, another couple drove in with a van and we chatted with them a bit, which helped us sleep through the night. But it definitely wasn't a restful sleep. We ended up reporting the tent to the police, and there was never a follow-up. So, me and a friend were out late one night, probably at about 10 p.m. or so, and we were chasing the sound of coyotes on the back end of my property. We had a suppressed 22, and we were going to see if we could catch one with that and hopefully drive the pack away from my chickens. Well, we found a nesting spot for a group of deer when we were making our way to the back of the property. If you haven't seen this, it's basically just a flat spot in a patch of grass or sometimes in the woods, and in this case, a tall patch of grass. Well, anyway, we're coming up past this spot when we saw a nesting area, and we see this beautiful buck. It's not hunting season, and we're not equipped to deal with it, even if it was in addition to the fact that it's nighttime. So we just take the opportunity to enjoy looking at this beautiful six to eight point buck when he turns and looks at us. Now, we're probably 75 yards away from him, looking over the tall grass, coming through what is probably his nesting spot, or the nesting spot for some of his doe. Now, it's not like he's going to be protective over the spot or anything. We actually expected him to take off and run as soon as he noticed us, but he didn't. Instead, this five and a half foot tall, probably 200 pound specimen of a buck started stomping his foot and back feet alternatingly. He's making this crazy wheezing noise like a person breathing through a plastic tube. It's pretty unsettling. I've never seen an animal act this way, let alone a deer. Compound that with the fact that me and my friend are out here in the dark. So we just sit there and watch. I've got the gun ready, but I have no expectation of needing it. I figured this buck is just acting funny. It's really early in the rut. He's probably just got his Jones going a little bit too hard. Too soon, not a big deal. Until the damn thing starts spinning, just hold on full speed spinning in a circle 
And then, I swear to God, there's no making this up. The damn thing starts laughing. Not wheezing, not coughing, laughing. Like a man laughs. Full on laughter. A clear chuckling laugh like a person standing behind the deer and laughing but it's coming from the deer. Then this thing stands up on two feet and bounces through the grass towards the woodlands and we never see it again, clearing a four foot fence in the process. Yeah, we gave up on the coyotes, went back, killed a 24 case and went to sleep. It has taken me years to finally write this down for someone to finally read it. Because the events that took place all those years ago left me puzzled and frankly disturbed. It's perhaps best if I provide some background and context because it may help strengthen my story. And people will hopefully believe me. I know that a lot of people claim to have a true story about strange encounters in the woods. And I don't want people to accuse me of making this all up, because honestly, I swear that this even really did happen. It's not supernatural. It took place during the daytime, and the monster is very much human. When I was approximately 13 or maybe 14 years old, 2003 to 2004, I went on a camping trip with my mother and stepfather and my four younger siblings. We were not a very well-off family. In fact, we were quite poor. I never went on holidays abroad, and we would always go camping, usually to the same campsite, which felt like miles away, but was in reality less than 10 miles from the city where we lived. We had been there a few times previously and knew the campsite and the surroundings very well. It felt pretty safe and familiar. On this occasion, everything was going pretty normal. I hated camping. My parents would always argue when it came to putting up our tent. It was pretty boring being in the woods, and I would normally be the one entertaining my siblings. I hated not having electricity, access to proper toilets and showers, etc., it could be quite fun looking back, and I do treasure the memories I have with my stepdad, who is no longer with us. Usually, we would go on long hikes or bike rides with my stepdad, using maps to charter our way to a small village, promising to get us all ice cream, which was a real treat as we never normally had it. On this camping trip, we were going to go on a 10-mile bike ride. Both my parents had their own bikes, along with my sister and I. My stepdad's bike had the small trailer where my three younger siblings, all under the age of five, were sat. It was hard work going on these epic long bike rides, but I rather enjoyed being in the middle of the woods, surrounded by nature. We weren't in the middle of nowhere, but it was remote enough for it to be inaccessible to public transport. Only forest ranger type vehicles could access the roads. They weren't real roads, just paved with tarmac. More like dirt roads, which were really only suited for bicycles. During all the times we went camping, we never saw any other vehicles go down these roads. On this day, we were all cycling down this road when suddenly we hear the sounds of a vehicle coming up slowly behind us. My stepdad is in front of us when he stops and tells us to move aside to let the vehicle come past. There's a sense of urgency and confusion in his tone as he's unsure why there's even a vehicle here. The vehicle passes us, and we were expecting to see a forest ranger vehicle. You know, like a 4x4 pickup or Land Rover type of vehicle. But instead, we see an estate station wagon type of car with a long body and a large trunk 
with a window at the back. In the back of the station wagon, I see several large trash bags, and it's a very strange sight. I may only be a teenager, but this is a sight that sets off alarm bells for several reasons. Number one, this is not a car that is designed for going off-road in the woods. Number two, as previously mentioned, we have never encountered any vehicles down this bike road before. Number three, the person driving is clearly not lost as they didn't stop to ask for directions. Number four, there are big black trash bags in the back of the car that look very suspicious. What I mean by this point, they are full and tied up very tightly. We could all see into the back of the car and I didn't see anything poking out of the bag to indicate it was full of garbage. Number five, the driver looked very rough, and I don't mean to sound rude. He looked very mean. I can't recall his features, just that he didn't look like a friendly person that belonged in the countryside. He wore dark clothing. I think he was clean-shaven and had very short hair. I wish I remembered more about what this man looked like. As of this incident, couldn't get any stranger. What took place next has left such an impression on me that I still recall the sense of fear that I felt at the time as I write this story. My palms are getting very sweaty and my heart is racing. The car drives several more feet. Then the driver stops. For what feels like the longest time in my entire life, nothing happens. We're all just watching this car. My stepdad has told us to remain still. He is being very serious as he's assessing the situation. Then the car's reverse light comes on and the car starts reversing up to us. My stepdad, who was in the army for several years and was one of the toughest guys I knew, goes into full on panic mode. He tells us to run. We don't even get on our bicycles to ride. Instead, we just flee on foot, running with our bicycles through the woods until we find a railway bridge, which had been previously passed over. We never look back. I have no idea if the man in that car got out to go after us. I don't know if he just continued driving. I have no idea who he was or what was in those bags. We never really spoke about what happened that day. I know it was something that seriously scared my stepdad because of his response, and it's left frightened about who I might encounter in the woods until this very day. The first paranormal experience I had was back when my age was in the single digits, around seven or eight years old. I grew up in the Midwest, Ohio to be more specific. The town, village as we grew up calling it, was not large by any means, around 40 to 50 people at most. During this time, my family didn't have the internet or cable TV. Cell phones were just starting to become mainstream, mid-90s era, and as such entertainment was mostly chores or roaming the surrounding area exploring. My house was backed by fairly dense woods. There was a steep decline with a relatively flat wooded area where a creek ran through. This creek wasn't very deep, waist deep in certain areas, but mostly knee or ankle deep but it was wide. Growing up, I lived in those woods, hiking up and down the creek, mapping the woods, exploring a few long abandoned and collapsed houses that nature reclaimed. I lived and breathed nature, and those woods were my home away from home. My father grew up in that area. My aunt, uncle, and cousins lived just next door and it was a pretty close-knit community. Naturally, everyone has ghost stories about their own hometown, 
a haunted house, a tragedy of some sort that remains a stain on its history. My village was no different. My father would always tell stories about ghosts or abnormal happenings he experienced in his youth. One thing he would always tell me when I told him I was going into the woods was, the trees may not walk about or talk, but they do see and remember. I always thought of that as him saying, don't be stupid out there. The first encounter with the people of the woods, which is what I always called them, was when I was in one of my daily excursions into the wild green. It was mid-July, and it was hot and humid. I stuck mostly to the creek as it was cool, and I didn't have to battle my way through thick undergrowth. I hiked approximately about two miles along the creek, hunting for crawdads, crawfish, and looking for signs of deer, rabbit, or the fabled albino squirrel. I kept traveling and eventually arrived at a relatively open field that had waist-high grass, and I frequently stopped here to gather wild blackberries, rest, and spooked a few white-tailed deer bedded in the area. But that day was different. As I drew closer to the field, I noticed someone standing there. Instinctively, I slowed down, lowered my posture, and tried to minimize my noise. I wasn't used to seeing anyone out this far into the woods. The nearest house to that location was about a mile and a half through thick undergrowth and fairly steep ravines to climb. As I hugged the bank of the creek, I moved to the edge of the open field slowly, peeking up over the tall grass to see if they were still there. Nothing. I thought that perhaps they seen or heard me trudging through the creek and instinctively ducked too. I wasn't about to find out, so I turned around and headed back home, all two and a half miles back. I was more aware of my surroundings and far more cautious of my sound as I moved, avoiding walking into the creek to prevent the sloshing of water to give me away. As I crept through the branches, jutting out into the bank of the creek, I made my way to another area I was very familiar with. A small game trail ran through here, and it was cut by time and distance back home a good bit. The only downside was it was pretty overgrown to either side, and portions had thick thorn bushes. The entire time I trekked back, I felt as if I was being watched. I never felt in danger or vulnerable of being attacked, but I could feel eyes on me. I was uneasy the entire time. I followed the game trail, routinely stopped, and listening to determine if I could hear footsteps or if I was being followed. Still, nothing. I made it about halfway back home when I seen in the corner of my eyes a figure standing a short distance away. But as I moved my eyes in that direction of the figure, they seemed to just meld into the foliage. I thought maybe my paranoia was making me see things, so I just continued. A few hundred feet more, I again seen another figure, this time further away out of my peripheral, and again, as I looked in that direction, they'd meld back into the background. But this time, it happened twice. As I looked and that figure disappeared while another appeared again in my peripherals, closer but still always away. The entire time, I never felt to be in danger. Creeped out, yes, but I never felt like whatever was there was nefarious and intent. This continued on for the remainder of my time making my way back home, but the more it happened, the less I felt afraid of the figures, even going as far as saying out loud, I know you're there. I don't know what you want, but I'm not here to cause trouble. Eventually, I made it back to my backyard 
and I turned around to face the woods to see if they were still there. But nothing again. My father was next to his shed burning some cut grass in the backyard. I walk over to him and tell him what I had experienced, and before I could say a word, he looked at me and with a slight grin said, I see you saw them too. I guess I had the look of terror written on my face. Without even missing a beat, he put down the hoe he was using to stoke the fire, walked past me to the woodland, and pulled out the can of dip he had in his pocket. He opened it, took a pinch out, and placed it on a stone that was jutting out from the ground and walked back. I asked what he did, and he said he gave them an offering. He began explaining what he meant by the trees see and remember, that it was important that we respect nature whenever we enter her domain and give an offering in return when we take things from her. Otherwise, she may not let us back out. He gave me the can of dip and said what I saw were what he believed were spirits of Native Americans keeping watch over their former land. I didn't really know what they were at the time, but I followed suit with what my dad did whenever I made my way back into the woods. I always left an offering, and although I still did see them from time to time, I never felt like I was ever in danger, and I always made sure to respect them. If they appeared in my peripherals, I would travel in the opposite direction, apologizing for any transgressions. My cousins and many people in my village all were aware of their existence and just kind of gave them a wide berth whenever they appeared. I was oblivious to their existence, but when I learned of them and experienced them, a whole lot of people opened up about them about some of the history of the town. It was an interesting experience. I'd like to preface this story by stating, I'm a highly educated and scientific person and have never been a believer in the supernatural, Bigfoot or things of that nature. That being said, I'm at a loss for the things my family has encountered on my property over the last seven years and would love to hear your suggestions. Here's my story. Seven years ago, my wife and I purchased a property and 11 acres of woods in a rural part of northeastern Minnesota. The woods were connected to a larger acreage of fields and woods of about 160 acres. And although sparsely populated, the land is near a fairly busy highway. There are some housing developments in the area, but they are three to four miles away, and the majority of the land all around our property is farm fields, woods, and rivers. It's remote, but with towns so close, I wouldn't call it wild by any means. I'm mentioning this because I've heard many Native American legends of things in the deep northern woods of Minnesota and Canada. But the area in which we live is not that. Rural, yes, but not the endless north woods. As I said earlier, I'm not a believer in the supernatural and have never been afraid of the woods or the outdoors, even though I have a healthy sense of caution and respect for large bears, moose, wolves, and other potentially dangerous wildlife. I am also an avid hunter and mountaineer and have experienced many nights in the wilderness. I've had numerous encounters with dangerous animals or situations, so I'm not spooked easily. Knowing my state of mind is important to my story because many so-called supernatural encounters can be explained by people with an already high level of belief, anxiety, or fear. That's just not me. Well, that all changed after the first few weeks of moving in.
The house and land have been abandoned for a couple of years due to foreclosure, so a lot of work needed to be done to get it back in shape. Wildlife had grown accustomed to no human presence, and black bear frequently roamed the yard at night, along with many other woodland creatures. We also found a lot of animal bones scattered throughout the forest, and coyotes were abundant. One night, during those first few weeks, we had a rainstorm, and I was worried about a broken downspout potentially causing a basement leak. It was about 10 p.m., so I grabbed my headlamp and headed outside to deal with the situation. Behind our house is a fairly large, swampy area that divides the woods. I had my back facing this area while fiddling with the downspout when suddenly I had this intense feeling of dread. It's really hard to explain the feeling, but it was like my body knew something was back there. It was very unusual, based on the circumstances, that is. Never having felt this type of fear before, I tried to stay calm and slowly turn around to point my headlamp towards the swamp. What I saw was something I still cannot explain. Eyes. Numerous glowing and reflecting eyes staring back at me. Those were not eye reflections that you typically see with a deer or other animals, since they were at different heights, and when I pointed my headlamp, spot being directly at where you would expect a head to be, there was nothing there but weeds and trees. When I turned the headlamp off, they were still there and glowing as if a light was being shined. They did not move, they just stared through me. Needless to say, I bolted and ran as fast as I could back into the house and explained it away as deer or raccoons. Later that summer, I was sitting out on our screened-in porch that partially faces the swamp and connected woods to the west. It was approximately 11 p.m. when I began to hear what sounded like a bear fighting with or attacking a cow. Since there was a small farm to the southwest of my property, I assumed that perhaps a cow had wandered into the woods and had been attacked by a bear. I really didn't know if this was something a bear would actually do, but it was my only guess based on the sounds I was hearing at the time. It was clearly some kind of roar like a bear and then followed by a frantic sounding cow mooing. This went on for over an hour, and it was perhaps one of the most horrible sounds I've ever heard. Even though it sounded so strange and almost supernatural, it didn't frighten me since I had this rational explanation in my head. Even weirder, the same species of sounds happened again the next summer. These first few years, I never investigated the area of the woods that sound came from since it was on my property. A couple of years later, I had the chance to purchase this area and 70 acres to the west, which consisted of the woods that connected to mine as well as a few tilled fields, more woods and ponds. As part of purchasing this land, I spent a great deal of time walking around on it to get a good understanding of its value and layout. As part of my walk, I was able to get a much better look at the farm set up to the south. The farm did have cows, as I suspected, but to my surprise, the area they were kept in was a long distance from my house much too far for me to hear them, and the fencing was also extremely well built and electrified. Looking at it, there was just no way a cow was wandering off from that farm. I didn't really think about this fact until recently, but feel it's best to lay everything out in chronological order. After acquiring the property, I proceeded to put up tree stands at various locations along with trail cameras in order to peep for the upcoming deer hunting season. 
One spot was the hilly woods where I heard those sounds many years prior. Again, I did not connect these two things until now. The area was very odd, as whenever I hiked there, I always saw some new strange thing. One time, my son and I found an old game snare tied to a tree with what looked to be dried blood on the tree bark. Another time, we found at least a 100-year-old tree with a barbed wire fence completely spiraling the entire trunk growing in and out at different intervals. I've also found many tree trunks with very large scratches or claw marks not resembling an antler rub. Perhaps a bear? We'd almost always find dead animal bones in this area, and even this winter I found a couple of deer legs snapped and picked clean. My sons have found numerous animal skulls there as well. As I was saying, I put a game camera in this area since I had seen tracks and signs and wanted to get a sense of the best places to hunt. I've placed one there many seasons and have yet to capture a single thing on it. Nothing. My son has posted theirs a couple of times for hunting season and has mentioned the strange sense of quiet. He's used to the forest sounds coming back after sitting still for long periods of time. But in this spot, there are never any sounds. He has mentioned hearing something walking around though. Another incident occurred one hunting season when I was entering this area en route to another stand when I saw a violent thrashing in the foliage moving fast and crossing from right to left moving away from my position. I of course encounter deer and bear all the time so I am familiar with how they move when spooked but this was something different. Whatever this thing was made a high-pitched trumpeting combined with a bellowing sound, and that was like nothing I'd ever heard from an animal outside of an elk, which we don't have in this area. It wasn't bounding, and there wasn't the raised white tail or large dark mass to indicate a deer or bear. There really didn't appear to be a body at all, just whipping and falling leaves and branches along with the deafening sounds. A year after this incident, my son went out hiking in the woods to try and find me, since I was out doing some forest management. As we walked through this area, he thought he spotted me coming through the woods fast, but quickly noted the walk and clothing were nothing like mine. Whoever it was, was also a lot taller than me, and he described him as extremely thin. He said the person he saw did not notice him at all, and seemed to be walking in a straight line like they had tunnel vision or something. Seeing someone in this part of the woods in their direction of travel don't at all make sense since there really would be no reason to be there or to be headed that way, as it leads to deep ravines and an uncrossable river. After he found me and explained what he saw, I quickly went over to investigate to see if we had a trespasser. I hiked for quite a while, but never found anything or anyone. If someone was there, they either got picked up on the road or vanished. That same year, my son had a friend over and they went for a late afternoon walk in the woods. As it began to get dark, they made their way back by walking on the edge of the field that is next to this area of woods. After they passed by, they said they saw a figure a little ways off in the trees. Whatever they saw was near one of the hills in this patch of forest and seemed to be making some kind of hand gestures. It began walking slowly toward them when they called out, Hey, hello? He or it stopped still and said nothing. 
It was at this point the boys sensed something wasn't right and bolted back towards the house. They rushed into the house and told me what they saw, and I of course laughed it off as their mind playing tricks on them. My son described the figure as very tall, like 10 to 15 foot, but with skinny arms and his body was dark all over. No hair per se, but dark. They even thought it was an animal at first because of the weird way it looked. He couldn't really describe it very well other than gaunt or skinny and strangely dark. Me being the curious and protective father I am, I was worried about it being trespassers, drug addicts, or both, so I told them I would go take a look for myself. They brought me to the area and pointed to where it was standing, and I headed into the woods. Since it was winter and there was snow on the ground, I thought it would be easy to locate the tracks of whatever this was and find out where it came from or went to. When I got to the spot, there wasn't a single track or disturbance in the snow. There was no way an animal or man could have been in that area and not left tracks. They had either made it up or their minds had played tricks on them, or so I thought. To this day, my son and his friends still swear they saw it clear as day, and I can definitely attest that their fright was real. My wife has also experienced strange thrashing sounds and other feelings of dread or being watched in this part of the woods and generally refuses to go over there anymore. All this brings me to today where I had a sudden realization that all of the strange sounds, sightings, bones, and events seem to be centered around this one area and I'm just at a complete loss to what it all means. It's all too strange to really bring this up and discuss it with people. I know around here, but I wanted to share my story and see if anyone in this community might have any theories or ideas on what it might be and what we're dealing with here. I'll continue to investigate on my end but would love to see what you all think. So I'll preface this story with the fact that I'm traditionally not a very spiritual person. I have always been quite cynical of paranormal activity. And even though I know that there may be some things beyond our understanding, I've always believed that there's usually a very logical scientific reason for most paranormal occurrences. Everyone in my friendship group also shared this view until what happened the other night. So my mates, my boyfriend and I, on a uni residence, which is surrounded by a dense Australian forest. I have been here for a year now and have enjoyed going on multiple bushwalks, both during the day and at night. I grew up surrounded by bush. My high school was on a 200 acres of bush, and I live on a country property in the middle of nowhere. So, at this point, the land and the forest have become my safe space. I have been in the uni forest plenty of times to take a breather from uni stress, and I have never noticed anything sinister in there. Over the past few weeks, my boyfriend and his mates have been building a pretty impressive fort in the bush. They have spent every free minute taking an axe to old dead logs and building this fort, which is about the size of a caravan. Understandably, they're pretty proud of this creation, so last night they decided to show some third years what they have been working on. As they were walking around the fort, these third years stopped and told us they didn't want to go further. They told us that they had some bad experiences in that section of the forest, and they told us they were too scared to venture in. 
It was almost about midnight at this point, so it was very dark. I thought these third years were merely pranking us, so I began joking and making light of the situation. To my surprise, though, my boyfriend, his name is Matt, and my best friend, whose name is Darcy, were very accommodating of the third year's fear and told them they'd be happy to accompany them out of the bush. They oddly seemed kind of freaked out themselves. I then remembered that Matt had actually told me before that the bush would be quite scary at night, which actually amused me because usually he's the type of annoying macho man who believes that fear is a sign of weakness. One of the third years, Nick, wanted to press on, but the other two, Kyle and Adam, wanted to head back. I had seen the forts a few times, so I volunteered to go back with Kyle and Adam. As we were leaving the forest, I asked Kyle and Adam what made them so scared of the forest. They told me they didn't want to talk about it when we were in there, but they did point it out to me that the section of the forest we were in was unnaturally still and quiet. As a cynical person, I had to admit that it was a bit odd that only the section we were in was dead still, whereas about 20 meters away, across the road, the trees were blowing madly in the wind. Once we had left the forest, Kyle and Adam's demeanor changed significantly, and they felt finally comfortable expressing to me what they had experienced in the bush before. Very long story short, across the three years that they have lived on Res, they, and a few other people, have had multiple encounters with what seemed to be an odd-looking spirit in the shape of a man in a hunched-over position. The spirit always accompanied by the bush going unnaturally silent and an overwhelming feeling of impending evil and doom. He told me that the reason the forest goes so still and quiet is because something inside of it is listening to you and hunting you. Kyle, being a man of indigenous culture, told me that at one point, the spirit was so close to one of his friends that he had to call in an aboriginal elder to run a smoking ceremony. The elder told Kyle that the presence of evil was overwhelming in the forest, and she warned him never to go in too deep again. Kyle also began educating me about another aboriginal legends and expressing his fear of the noises, like screams and whistles, distinctly human screams and whistles, not foxes or birds and the feelings he had experienced in the bush. At this point, I'm listening ardently, but was also viewing these stories as purely fictitious, as opposed to someone to be concerned about. Even though I didn't really believe in the stories, I was interested in learning more about the Aboriginal culture. And I was honored that Kyle was opening up to me about something which seemed to be very personal and significant to him. About half an hour later, Matt, Darcy, and Nick emerged from the forest and headed back over towards us. As they approached, I could tell that they seemed pretty obviously shaken up by something. And for the first time that night, definitely not the last, I suddenly felt very anxious. Matt and Darcy explained that they were showing Nick the fort when all of a sudden they felt an overwhelming feeling of dread and they all unanimously decided that they needed to leave. Matt also admitted to momentarily catching a glimpse of what he said had looked like a hunched over man in front of a tree near the fort. He said he would have thought it was shadow had he not seen the man's eyes reflect the light on his phone torch. At this point, my belief 
that they were pranking us diminished entirely, as Kyle was visibly freaking out and Matt looked shaken. I could tell that they weren't acting, and I also didn't believe Kyle would exploit his own culture for the sake of a cheap joke. We are all now headed back to our respective dorms, as we figured we'd better get as far from the forest as possible. I felt much better to be inside, only until Matt turned to me and suddenly said, I need to go back and talk to Kyle. When I looked into his eyes, I could tell something was very wrong, and my anxiety amped up significantly. Him behaving this way was very unusual, and something was clearly bothering him. So, we headed over to Kyle's unit and knocked on the door to his room. Matt explained to both of us that two days prior, he had come across a massive tree in a clearing that was covered in some odd sort of bulbs. Him being an absolute moron decided it would be clever to take an axe to the bulbs to see what they were made of. He admitted that the reason he was asking Kyle about it was because he couldn't shake the memory or thought of this tree and it was becoming unbearable and stressful. Kyle was obviously furious about this, as it turned out that the tree Matt had damaged was very sacred and ancient, and Kyle believed that Matt might have angered the forest and the spirits within it. He asked Matt if he had experienced any incidents over the past few days, and Matt matter-of-factly told us that the gash on his face, caused by a falling branch that missed his eye by a mere centimeter, actually happened only 20 minutes after he axed the tree. He also told Kyle that he had lied when he initially told us he'd seen the hunched man for the first time tonight. He had, in fact, seen him three times over the course of the past week and twice in the past two days. He also told us that the reason he left the forest the night of axing the tree, besides the fact that he had a bleeding cut on his face, was because all the boys working on the fort had suddenly heard a very, very unnatural sound in the forest. Something between a human scream and a whistle. They said that they would have thought it was an animal had everything else not suddenly gone completely silent. When they heard the noise again, closer this time, they grabbed their stuff and legged it. It was almost at the point when I realized that over the past two days, and I could literally pin it to whenever Matt was around, I had felt extremely agitated and sad. It was a very intense feeling, and I felt really guilty because it was nothing Matt was doing to upset me that was causing my distress. It was as simple as it being his energy or his vibe that was bothering me. I love this man. We have never had any arguments, but the night after he axed the tree, which he didn't tell me about, and which I don't condone, by the way, I remember feeling such a distant feeling of discomfort whenever he was around me. It got so bad at one point that I locked myself in my room and cried all night about it. I was confused and sad that the person I loved was making me this distressed when he had seemingly done nothing wrong. I pinned it on my period, except that it is not due for another week, and usually doesn't cause such emotional deregulation. I'm still not necessarily saying that the trees and Matt's energy were linked, but it was a feeling that was so weird to me and so unexplainable to begin with, so this almost made sense to me. Kyle now told Matt that he and I and everyone else involved in making the fort needed to get saged as quickly as possible to ward off any evil spirits around him. Matt despite his initial belief, agreed immediately. We met with another aboriginal student, Ash, and their partner, Key, 
and they provided the sage. Before the ceremony, Key told us they were going to go gauge the vibes, and Ash told us that Key had an innate ability to fill spirits in the wind. The second that Key walked out in the unit, I swear to God that the wind did one of the weirdest things I have ever experienced. It was the biggest gust of wind so far, and it carried the faintest howl of about five different notes and octaves. It came from well beyond the tree line like a wave and flew unnaturally quickly in our direction. It flew through me as if collecting my shadow, and it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. It didn't feel sinister, though, and Key reassured us that it was a normal phenomenon and that they experience it whenever in touch with the spirits. What wasn't normal, though, was the smell that permeated in the air about 30 meters from the tree line. It was almost artificial and like nothing I had ever smelt before, and it clearly scared Key as they began to tell us that something was very, very wrong. Key told us that something was stalking us from just beyond the tree line, and that it was very, very angry. Apparently, we needed to begin to sage now, or else it would follow us into the residence. As we walked to the glow of the nearby lamppost, Key told us that it was too late, and that the evil thing was already following us. And... And that was when the brand new, relatively expensive, lighter we had recently brought broke. It just completely broke. We tried to light the sage and the button fell off and the thing cracked open. We now needed a lighter and Key told us that the thing was getting closer and closer. Whether it was related or not, I could not stop shaking despite being warm under a lot of layers of clothing. As a pack, we headed to a room to get a new lighter, and Ash advised us that Matt should stand away as we tried to light the sage. After a couple of attempts, where the fire bent around the sage, and I mean literally, was repealed by the stick, Matt stood far enough away and it lit. Once we were fully saged, we were all feeling significantly better, and we were ready to sleep. It was probably about 2.30 in the morning at this point. I got back to Matt's room, now completely comfortable around him for the first time in two days, and we got into bed. The other two people in our rooms were already asleep and sleeping soundly. Matt and I talked for a while about random stuff, nothing ghostly, and I ended up feeling very comfortable and happy as we eventually stopped talking and he drifted off. As a bit of an insomniac, it takes me a while to doze off, so usually I go on my phone until I feel sleepy. That was when it happened. It started with a very faint tap that I played not much mind to, but in hindsight, didn't have a known source. Then the dogs from the suburb across from the uni went nuts. It was a very faint sound, but they were disturbed nonetheless. Nothing made me think that it was anything paranormal until multiple things happened at once. The room went very still and silent as if a ward of cotton had replaced the air. The heater stopped. The faint noises of breathing stopped. Even Matt, next to me, was silent. And then my legs went icy. Icy cold. Unnaturally icy. The rest of my body was warm, but legs were freezing. Then my entire body, just as suddenly became uncomfortably hot. Initially, I was worried I was having a stroke or a heart attack or something. Finally, an all-consuming, overwhelming, intense feeling of evil permeated everything. It was evil and angry and like nothing 
I had ever felt before. I couldn't link it to a specific spot in the room, but I knew it was strongest near Matt. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't speak. I knew it wasn't sleep paralysis because I had been on my phone the entire time and was not remotely sleeping. I could also move freely and I didn't feel paralyzed. I sat bold upright and felt a panic attack coming on. I'm usually not one to cry very easily, and I'm never one to have a panic attack, but this rendered me to both. I was sitting upright and praying with everything I could think of for this to go away. I was shaking and crying. I didn't want to wake the others to ask them if they could feel it because I knew that would anger it. I didn't end up needing to wake them, though, because Matt awoke suddenly with a start. It scared the life out of me because his voice cut the silence, but he was just asking if I was okay. I was not okay. The thing was now feeling more evil than ever. I couldn't speak. I just sat there more terrified than I have ever been in my entire life. Matt then went dead silent and said to me, You feel all right? I didn't even nod. I was praying with everything I could muster. I'm not even religious, but I was calling on all the limited things I knew about religion. God, Jesus, angels, etc. I was repeating in my mind that I meant the thing no harm and that I'm sorry if I offended it. All I remember saying aloud is, something is very, very bad. And Matt just nodded, looking terrified. Eventually, after what felt like a lifetime of prayers, the feeling began diminishing and everything slowly felt calm again. Noise returned, the breathing of the others in the dorm, the heater cranked on, the wind outside resumed. Whatever it was, seemed to have left. Once I felt safe enough to lie down, Matt and I snuggled up together and tried our best to fall asleep. I was worried the thing would return when Matt fell asleep in order to attack him when he was vulnerable, but it didn't. Thank you, God. My sleep was ridden with nightmares about spirits and I woke up unusually early. In the morning, though, I seemed to feel okay. Matt and I talked, and he reckons we both were freaked out off the back of a really creepy night. What's weird enough, though, is that before that encounter, or whatever it was, I was not even remotely scared. To be honest, when I went to bed that night, I was still pretty skeptical there was even a spirit to begin with. Not that morning, though. I'm still convinced that it was a spirit in the room that night. I have never, ever felt anything like that fear I felt in that situation. I've watched horror movies. I've intentionally freaked myself out in creepy places before, and only that night did I feel any sort of presence. I can't entirely describe it. I asked Kyle, Ash, and Key that morning, if we should be concerned about it visiting our room, and they told us that if whatever it was wanted to hurt us, it would have done so by now. They said they believe it was more of a warning for us to leave it alone, more of a threat than an act of violence. We also then discovered, as Darcy went back into the bush that day, Matt and I declined the invite that their well-structured, carefully constructed fort that could carry the weight of all of them had collapsed in the night. It wasn't a stormy night. It wasn't any more windy than any other night had been. The fort had entirely caved in on itself, as if having been trampled on by a large creature. Whether these things are coincidental or not, I'm not sure, but it sure freaked me the hell out. I haven't had any odd experiences since, but 
I also haven't gone back to the forest either. I still don't know whether or not I want to. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, backwoods, creepy stories. I would like to take a minute and thank the reformed members of Back to Ashes. Mrs. Innerscare, Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise Sess, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norman D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty Sneeze. Thank you all for investing in Back to Ashes. I have no words how much I appreciate your support. Since I missed January, so far I'm going to go ahead and give a shout out to the January birthdays along with the Februaries. January, Olivia's mom on the 10th, Olivia's sister on the 30th, Howler's mom on the 28th. February, Hannah Jacobs on the 5th, Dominique the 10th, who will be 18 years old. Congratulations. Welcome to adulthood. <laughs> Have fun. La Sparkle on the 24th. And I guess I'll tuck mine in there too. My birthday is February 22nd. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. And as always, peace, love, and light to you all.